Hey, Jonathan Hederly here, and today we're going to be discussing the psychological themes found in the film Good Will Hunting. Psych Cinema is Shrink Tank's video series where I explore the psychology found in the films that I watch and love. Now, I love Good Will Hunting, but today we're tackling this film as a result of our viewers sending us recommendations. We've been asking for it, so here you go. We're going to tackle Good Will Hunting. Hopefully by now you're familiar with the story of Goodwill Hunting, but if not, let me quickly refresh your memory. Directed by Gus Van Sant, starring Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, and Robin Williams, it's the story of Will Hunting, a brilliant but troubled young adult, and we see his personal growth as he develops a relationship with the therapist played by Robin Williams. It is a great movie, it's very tender, and I also love the soundtrack. So for those of you that aren't familiar, it really introduced Elliot Smith to the world. So the film is 21 years old, so hopefully I don't have to put out a spoiler alert, but if so, I'm gonna talk about this movie. So go see it and then come back if you haven't already, okay? But if you haven't, what have you been doing for 21 years? Go see this movie, it's a classic. But anyhow, let's talk about the psychology in Goodwill Hunting. The character of Will Hunting, we assume through the film that he kind of has a rough childhood and upbringing and some of the details come out later in the film during one of his therapy sessions with Robin Williams. But we know from a psychological standpoint that a nurturing and warm uh, childhood and home environment is really crucial for the development of young kids into young adulthood and into adulthood. And so it, it's not surprising that if Will exhibits a lot of behavioral problems and impulse problems as an adult that he really had an inhospitable home environment as a child. So one of the things that the film really depicts well, I think, as a mental health professional is the challenge that men, especially young men, have in opening up and talking about their feelings and expressing themselves. We know there's a number of reasons for that. First and foremost, girls develop verbal skills earlier than boys. Second is that girls talk more than boys, and that may sound like sort of a, a sexist statement, but research tells us that the average woman will say 20,000 words a day, the average man will say 12,000 words a day. So you developmentally, they develop the ability to speak and put to language what they're feeling earlier, and then it just becomes more of an automatic, normal process. The other thing from a so sociological standpoint we often see is that Young girls early on are given the message of like, are you upset? What's wrong? Let's talk about it. And so very often they find that to be very cathartic and helpful. Whereas boys a lot of times because of some of their behavioral um, issues and acting out, a lot of times it's kind of like they go act it out or go get rid of that restless energy. But even when parents and other people want to know what's going on with a young boy, they don't always have the, the verbal skills and the language to be able to describe what they're feeling or what's going on. And we see this with Will Hunting, not so much in that he can't speak and articulate, it's that it's very uncomfortable and it's very out of character for him. In fact, he probably represents what most men um, feel when it comes to like talking about your emotions or the idea of therapy. It's a sign of weakness. It, it kind of challenges their, their own personal understanding of masculinity. For, for a lot of men, um, you don't talk about your problems or your feelings. Um, you don't whine about your problems and you solve your problems. And in any fashion where you can't do that, it sort of kind of undercuts your masculinity and your capability to problem solve on your own. But the character Will Hunting eventually corners himself because of some of his legal problems that in order to kind of reduce the consequences of his actions, uh, his out is really to undergo therapy with Robin Williams' character. And there we start to see a little bit more of the interior life and the story behind Will Hunting. And with that we see Robin Williams show mastery not only as an actor but the character that he's playing because a lot of men quite frankly don't want to go to therapy and you see this with Will Hunting is that it's almost like a standoff. Very comically actually you see him try to like out silence Robin Williams character and to show him what a waste of time it is for him to be mandated to go to therapy sessions to where he just sits through the whole session basically silent, not saying a single thing. But Robin Williams' character mas masterfully doesn't take the bait. So he doesn't fill up the time just sort of endlessly talking and chattering himself. 
he sits there silently with Will himself. And it's not so much to challenge him, but it's to, it's to not, it's, it's to kind of roll with the resistance. It's not to make a big deal out of Will's ambivalence or resistance to therapy. And there's actually a component of therapy called motivational interviewing where it really is about rolling with resistance. That's one of the key features of that versus challenging people, confronting people, making it more of an adversarial relationship. Now early on, Will kind of sees it that way because it's not his idea or his choice to go to therapy. He probably sees Robin Williams' character as his adversary. But then you start to see over time Will kind of disarm and open up and one of the things that you, you see is that it's not just Robin Williams or the therapist bombarding Will with question after question about his childhood and his feelings and his thoughts. It's actually uh, him talking a little bit about his own life and that opens up relatability to where he and Will kind of joke about the, the Boston Red Sox World Series and and how Robin Williams missed the pivotal game because he was off following the woman that eventually became his wife. And through their love of baseball or through a humorous or unbelievable anecdote, they're able to kind of connect on a more personal level. And this again is something that we know about therapy is that yes, coping skills and understanding how your brain works and understanding why we think what we think and what, how we feel um, is very important and a huge crucial point of therapy. But research tells us one of the most important, if not the most important variable for successful therapy is the rapport and alliance that a client has with their therapist. And so it's not just that they're an expert or they're knowledgeable, it's really feeling a connection that um, of trust, uh, believing that this person cares for me, believing that that person has my best intentions at heart. And you see the more that Will um, connects with his therapist, the more he starts to open up and show a side of himself. It's important to see Will open up to the Robin Williams character, Sean McGuire, because he exhibits a person that really only looks out for himself and maybe has some trust issues for others. You know, whether he's connecting with uh, Sean McGuire, the therapist, or Mini Driver's character, Skyler, uh, it's important for Will to connect because his troubled childhood has sort of sent the message that other people can't be trusted and that you need to look out for yourself. Now this actually, the, the exception to this is his group of friends that we assume are kind of childhood friends um, and Ben Affleck in particular is his best friend that he opens up to him and he never wants to let him down. There's really a, a strong element of loyalty to the point where at some, some point in the film when Will is being kind of um, presented with all these possibilities of jobs and growth and, and leaving Boston. Uh, Will initially turns it down like, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna leave you all. And that's when Ben Affleck's character has to confront him and say, listen, don't be stupid. Don't throw your life away for me. The best thing you could ever do is get out of these circumstances. And he kind of, Ben's character recognizes like this is kind of maybe what I'm destined to do, but you're destined for so much more. Don't sacrifice it for my sake. And, and so you, you see Will start to really open up to other people, but it's a big challenge for him. It's a big challenge for him because of his childhood and that attachment that he can be suspicious and not trusting. And, and you see that come to full head when he and Skylar have a falling out and, and instead of uh, opening up and letting her in like she desperately wants, he pushes her away and lies and says that I've never loved you. Now an interesting thing is that there is a study that Harvard did called the Men's Grant Study. And it was over 75 years in the making. It's one of the longest longitudinal studies, if I said that right. It's one of the longest longitudinal studies ever. And it followed over 200 men for 75 years. And every six months to two years, it would follow up with them, get some data metrics of what they were doing, where they were living, what was going on in their life. And then they would often ask them, now rate your happiness in your life. And then they took all that data and they published it. And what they found was there was one variable more than any others that stood out to 
This is the key to a happy life for men. It's having loving relationships. And the flip side to that coin is, and when those men face tough times in their life, they didn't push those loved ones away. And that's really what you see the, the challenge with Will hunting, is he pushes people away. Oftentimes before they can hurt him or before they can abandon him. And that's why his relationship with Sean, the therapist, is so important. Because as he starts to open up to him, he starts to share a little bit about his troubled childhood and the physical abuse and violence that was inflicted on him by his father. And then Robin Williams' character, Sean, shares a little bit about his own personal experience and relatability to that. Now, one of the interesting things in that whole scene is how simple and yet uh, how mind-blowing it is because all that the Sean character, the therapist, says to Will over and over is, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And you see Will go from like a very like simple, superficial, like, yeah, I know that's not my fault, to where as it's repeated, it really starts to sink in that even though there's all this pain and even all this hurt and baggage that he's carrying, that it was not his fault. This didn't happen to him because of anything that he did or because of who he is. It was somebody else that did this to him. And Sean keeps repeating, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And again, Will knows this, but that moment is really crucial, not just because he's being reminded over and, go and over and over that it's not his fault, but because of who it's coming from. It's coming from Sean, and it's coming from somebody that's gone through that as well. And in some ways, you could kind of argue that uh, one of the things that, that Sean is actually communicating to Will is, you're not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to be alone. Because that's really one of the dilemmas that Will faces throughout this film, is that he's pushing people away that either want to love him or help him. And so when we think about that Harvard study, and that's the key to a happy life, that men can identify people that they love and love them in their life, and when, not if, but when hard times come, they don't push them away, either because they're going to tackle the problems by themselves, or when things get hard, they don't know how to let other people in. And one of the beautiful things about the film is you see Will, whether it be Sean, whether it be kind of a, a writing a different um, uh, kind of storybook ending for himself, or whether he pursues Skylar at the end, that he's able to change, he's able to see that he needs other people in his life, especially people that desperately want to be a part of his life. And so it's really interesting how Ben Affleck's giving him permission to leave him, whether it be to pursue this job, but in the end he recognizes Skylar is who he loves and that he really needs to go see about a girl. Well, that does it for this episode of Psych Cinema. Tell me what did you think about the film? Are there any psychological aspects that I overlooked or dismissed? You can certainly leave me a comment or drop me a recommendation of a film you would like for me to analyze here on Psych Cinema. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and also check out shrinktank.com where we post articles, videos, podcasts, and more, all of it exploring the intersection of pop culture and psychology. Thanks again for watching Psych Cinema. I'm Jonathan Hederly, and until next time, see ya.